Hello Saddlers fans and welcome back to Saddlers TV where today we're joined by striker Josh Gordon. Thanks for joining us Josh. An easy place for us to start would be back at Sunderland at the weekend. We started well, you got your goal. Just talk us through what it was like playing in front of nearly 35,000 fans. Uh, it was a good experience obviously when you got all them fans there making noise and cheering the way they cheered. It was, it was good. Obviously we, when we get a lot of fans at our place it, it helps us to have a bit of a boost. And I think having them fans there uh, in that atmosphere helped us to have the start we did. Obviously, I got my goal as well, which was good. Um, it was just unlucky that we didn't get the result we wanted in the end. And you say that we did start well, and it was all about pressing on the front foot. And when you're in the team, that is the sort of role that you, and the characteristic that you do bring to the team, is you're pressing on the front foot. And things seem to fall into place. You get that rub of the green, would you not say? Yeah, I think when I played in other positions, my work rate tends to be more defensive work but obviously when I'm playing up front I'm just able to occupy the two centre backs and me me be able to press from the front pressing high and not giving them any time allows us as a team to push higher so we're winning the ball in their half effectively and it's it's helped us in our performances so far. And when we look at Sunderland you you got a goal after it was four minutes and you're thinking here we go again it's it's Sunderland it's uh, it's another game that you're gonna pressed that sort of team at some somebody at the top of the league that we've already pressed several times this season to making more mistakes and it could have been two or three before they got their equaliser couldn't it yeah i think every time we played them we've seen like the better team we obviously uh, our place twice we should have beat them um but i got my goal at at, at walsall and uh, so did gino and having them having them goals against big teams gives you confidence to to play well and confidence to play him again. So getting that goal in the fourth minute, I felt like it was going to be our day. Unfortunately, it wasn't our day. No. But we go to a day that that was our day and a day that was your day as well. And we'll touch upon Bradford now. And it was a, a game that started off you thinking, oh God, here we go again. It's another poor start at home. Andy Cook gets sent off after six minutes. And then it's a word that the manager uses quite like that decision sort of galvanised you as a team, you get your two goals and it's a uh, case if you can kick on from there can't you? Yeah, um, obviously when we played Bradford, we started, I think we started quite bright to be fair and then obviously Kuki getting sent off, we all for like a split second were like what we're going to do here, top goal so it's come off, we just started well, it's going to upset the team and I think as a player who wants to play up front and been trying to get into the team in that position. I just thought, right, I've got to try to take it on my shoulders now and, and, and do that role. And luckily, I was in the right place at the right time for the first goal. And then that just boosted us all up. We ended up going two, we ended up going two nil up. And then when they scored, it was just a character of just belief, like we can do it with 10 men down. We've started well, we just need to go again. And then I've got, got my second goal and it was a great feeling. And from, you getting that second goal, it was a, a stat that I'm sure it's probably been drummed into you. Like it was actually our first fr direct from a, a corner this season. And you look at it now, I think you said it before, set pieces have been worked on and the goals are starting to come from them, aren't they? Yeah, uh, the gap has been strong on set pieces. Obviously, we've got two uh, tall centre backs, so really we should be uh, capitalising on that. And uh, what the smallest person on the pitch being me end up getting our first set piece and if, if I can score goals from a set piece so, so can our centre back so after that it just gives the confidence to go right this is one of our strong points here so we were doing in training a lot um, doing different types getting people into certain positions see where we're going wrong and it started to pick up and work we get it we got two off John Guthrie at Portsmouth yeah. Yeah. and you say there it is about confidence if the smallest man on the pitch can, can get a goal. You're expecting the big guys, like you said there, John and Dan Scar, and they both have now chipped in with goals. And it's just good to see that the goals are being shared around and not just relying on you guys up front to get them as well, isn't it? Yeah, as well, because obviously the way we play, we try to press them high up up the field. It leads to throw-ins in their final third and corners. and corners. So that's when we can get the big lads up and, and try and uh, capitalise on that. And it's not just the first, the first uh, phase; it's the second phase as well. So it's always staying, staying alive and being reactive and making sure 
we do what teams do to us and try campers in. And I think we're doing that a lot now. And from the Bradford game, we've said the word galvanise you there. It's almost a case of that opportunity with Andy Cook getting sent off sort of came at the right time for you because you've now been able to have a decent run starting in the team and you've almost shown what you can do up front on your own, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, Cookie's top goal scorer and, he, and every time he's played, he's done well. I'm, I'm close to him I'm close to him as a, as a mate as well. So I've never, we haven't got like a rivalry, but obviously you want to play where, where, where you believe that you can play. Um, so I played on the wing and I played in the number 10 role. So I don't, sometimes when I'm chopping changing positions, it's not always sticking to a game plan. It's a little bit different. So when I got the opportunity to play up front and I just know my game plan is to stay in between the, between the sticks and occupy two centre backs and not really running around going mad everywhere. It allows me to focus on my job and my job is to score goals. And, and I've shown that I've got three in the last five games and hopefully I'll get some more before the end of the season because it's helped me boost my confidence and, sh and again show what I've got. And you just said there that the, you're good mates with, with Cookie and you're not, it's not about a rivalry. It was something that um, I think Liverpool's Trent Alexander-Arnold said in an interview with Gary Lineker between him and Andy Robertson. You're both there, you're both, uh, they were both attacking fullbacks and they've got a little wager on this year as to who gets more goals and assists. But it's all about wanting to do well for each other, isn't it? And that mm. is still in the squad, isn't it? Yeah, of course, yeah. Like, um, after training sessions, we'll do stuff together. Uh, we'll always talk to each other and feed, feed off each other for advice and what we could have done, be could've, could've done better. Um, there's one of my chances at Burton where I tried to head the, bo head the ball across, but the keeper's done a good save. And the first place I'll go to is, is Kuki to say uh, what direct I could have done better because he again he's older than uh, older than me he's um, experienced and it's just nice to have have that player who's in the same position as you, as you who you can feed off and, and work with because I think, I think rivalry helps because you need you're a team you need to gel so I think it's I think it's good that we're close and can help each other out obviously friendly rivalry is okay and there is a buzz when you're both doing well or when the team is doing well because, like you've said there, you can feed off each other, you can go back to each other and being a, a more experienced head, although he doesn't act like it sometimes, he does act like a bit of a child, yeah. but that that adds to him, doesn't it? And that, that's good knowing that you can go to him for advice, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, like you said, he's a big kid at heart, but he can score goals and obviously... I did the other side of the game, I can work hard, I, I try to occupy the defenders, I, I, I stretch the game and his, ga his game is all about scoring goals. So for me to be able to learn off him and the positions he gets in and then and how to take some of the chances he takes, it's, it's just going to help me as a player. And we, you mentioned it earlier but you have played in, in different positions this year, we picked up on it. Um, off camera, we were talking about you've played left midfield, right midfield, uh, the centre attacking midfielder as part of a diamond, and then you've played up front. You're happy to play in those sort of roles. You're just happy to be on the pitch, aren't you? Yeah, obviously in an attacking way. I don't want to be centre back or right back or anything like that. But I'm quite diverse as a player. I played in these different positions at the other teams I've been at. I, at Leicester, I played on the wing. Um, I played in the 10 role even when I had experience with the first team so it was, it's because I have these different elements in my game I can play to feet and I like and I can go at plays and cross the ball but essentially I'd like to be playing up top where I can hold it and, and get my goals but you said that you don't want to be a defender but that is part of your game. You will do that so-called dirty side of the game if you need to when you are deployed on the wings, won't you? Yeah, I'm not one of these... Uh, Fair weather footballers. Yeah, that's the best way to say it, isn't it? Um, who just only come alive when, when they get the ball. Obviously, it's a team game and if I can do a job to help the centre-backs and get tackles and stuff, I'm, I'm not afraid to get stuck in. So. If it if it helps helps the team, it helps me as a player to to be shown and and, and get myself better. Then I don't mind doing it. I don't mind doing that dirty side. Well, that's something that you could have 
almost picked up off Cookie as well from corners. He's somebody who wins headers in both boxes and I just suppose it just show the diversity in the forwards that we've got this year that, that both of you will do that side of the game, doesn't it? Yeah, I think from a young age, obviously, because I am, I am not a very tall player. I've always been taught to time my jumps and because obviously I'm always going to come up against big centre-backs. So the heading side, I think it's just, I've just learned it as I've, as I've got older, it, as I've been gr growing as a, as a player and from a young age. So from doing the defensive side, because I have to come back and mark, even though I'm five foot nine, I'm still marking uh, big defenders in, in our own box. Cause I'm trusted to do that. So it, again, it's it helps, and obviously, someone like Cookie who is tall, who gets a lot of headers in, in both boxes, seeing what he does and being able to do the jobs what he does as well, is is good. And obviously, uh, uh, you were one of my first players that I interviewed when you when you moved to the club in the summer, and I think back then you did say it was quite a big step for you to, to move away from under 23s football, you wanted men's football. Just what has it been like for you in that you've played 38 games this season in all competitions, what's it been like for you developing as a player this season? Yeah, I think it's been good, obviously. It's more about winning games and, and getting points on the board and it starts becoming more, more serious. Obviously, playing on the 23 football, you still want to win and stuff, but when it comes to uh, times like this where we need to get as many points as we can, it starts showing your characteristics um, as a person, seeing how you can deal with it. And, it's, and, it's, and, and me personally, I've, I think I've grown as a person, like obviously doing that uh, role against Bradford, I have to just put the pressure on my shoulders and go, right, I need to do this now. And also on the pitch, just it, it's a bit more of the dirty side of football, not just tip-tappy football. It's have to have to be uh, brutal and, and just non-stop, and I think that's the little bits of the game which is completely different to under twenty threes football. And you said there it is almost like there is a livelihood on on the line for you guys, isn't there? But mm. we're in a relegation battle. There's twelve, thirteen teams in there, but there is something on the line for you guys, isn't there? Yeah, I think. Um, I know the position what we're in at the minute doesn't look good, but the league the league right now is is crazy. So anything could happen, but for us it's important that we do the best we can to avoid going down. Because obviously we want to be playing League One football as 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 we go on and and we, and all the players who will, will come up in Walsall's academy and stuff like that. It just we're not just doing it just for us, but we're doing it for the club. So it's, it is quite a lot of pressure, um, but I think all the lads are prepared to take that pressure on and, and get us out of, out of this position. Away from football though, it was, you jo it, you've been in professional football now for nearly three years. It was something that some people may not know about you, but football hasn't always been your number one avenue, has it? No, um, obviously I was at Stoke when I was younger, I uh, got released when I was 15 because of my height um, and then it was then starting to look at okay what are other options um, so I sit down with my with my family to see what um, the best route was I could have gone to Port Vale but my dad didn't want me to go to Port Vale at the time so I went to I went to college I was playing uh, Sunday football for a little bit went to college uh, do my education side and then um, as I was doing, went to college and I started just about to go to uni, uh, just started playing men's football, uh, same professional. So I was getting, I was earning a little bit there as well as doing uh, education. And then I fell into uh, teaching. So I was teaching at a primary school till obviously, till I went to Leicester about 21, 22. And then, yeah, everything's. But it, it's, it, it's something that younger footballers may not understand that. When you're in an academy, having an education is also very important because it will be a case of you're the, that one drop in the ocean almost that if you do get picked, then you are fortunate. But if you look at professional players now, they are starting to find things to fall back onto. You've got to have something there, haven't you? Yeah, um, everyone wants to be a footballer these days and, it, and it's so fickle. Like you could go through the academy from, from the age of eight and all the way to um, a first year pro when you still might not make it. 
So having an option um, outside of football, I think, is important just to fall back on. So like now, obviously, I've got my degree behind me. No one can take that away from me. So after football, for however long I'm, I'm in the professional football, um, I've got something to fall back on So for my next avenue. So I think it's always important to have a plan B as well as doing your best to try and do your dream job. I think it's something that not many people will pick up on, but those who take the route through non-league football that have been released and that they've been there, they've, they've done that, they do tend to have a more sensible head on them knowing that football isn't always going to be there. Most players will probably play up to 35. If they're lucky, they they know that they have to have something to fall back on, don't they? Yeah, I think it's just been in the real world, isn't it? Obviously, you see the other side of football. Some people who have just always been in football don't see what's after football because they're just so involved in that, which is not a bad thing. But if you have an understanding of, OK, right, I've got probably 35 years, if I'm lucky, of football, what, what am I going to do after that? And ha having that experience of not being a professional footballer gives you that understanding of um, what's going to come afterwards. So I feel like that's what's kept me grounded even even till now. I think it, it's good for you to experience that because some players don't. Some players won't know what's coming after football's finished. Not everybody goes into a coaching role or, or into an academy. It's almost something that you'll be able to pass on to other players, isn't it? To, to tell them that you do need to have something there. You do need to to get ready for it. And, and players could almost come to you, couldn't they, and say, how can I prepare myself for life after football? Yeah, um, when I was a teacher, obviously when I was um, in schools, there's lads there who want to be footballers and, and desperate to, to make it, but not really doing the right things in, in, in classroom. And I've always said to people like that, like, is, I play football as well, but it's important that you have an education as well, because it might not happen. As, as, as much as you want it to happen, there's, there's a high chance it's not going to happen. And um, still to this day, I have some teacher friends who still message me now with their sons and just asking me to speak to him, just to say, uh, just like keep going. One one lad got released um, from his football club. He's a bit disheartened, but you're gonna have knockbacks. And it's nice for me to be able to use my experiences to to tell them you need to keep going and, and, and try to do this and try to do that. And you just might it just might happen. So we, they get to see a real life person who's had these experiences, which they might be going through now, and and. And there is an opportunity for you to come out the other end. And you mentioned earlier, your dad played quite a part in you not moving to Port Vale after you'd been released from Stoke. How important has it been for you to have a family that supported you through your progression almost now? Uh, it's very important. Obviously, I've got my mum um, and my sister and people like that who are like the more loving and cuddly, cuddly, like cuddly kind of um, part of my life but then um, my dad because my dad used to be a basketballer and because of his height he's obviously he's not as tall um, it was a hard route for him so he's trying to use his experiences um, what he went through it, to pass up down to me to be able to be like it's going to be harder for you but you're going to have some knockbacks so you need to try to do this and that and being able to have his experiences uh, passed down to me it just gives me a bigger picture of what what's going on when knockbacks do happen and knockbacks are always a, a part of a sport, they're a part of life. But like you said there, having somebody who's been through it, who can, can offer you advice, it does show you that there is always going to be an avenue for you to, to carry on, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Um, like when I got released from Stoke, um, after my parents spoke to me about it, I didn't really feel disheartened because I felt like there is another option there. Um, and then when I went to college and uni, I had um, a trial at Peterborough that, that, that kind of fell through, but then I still stayed positive. I was like, there's gonna be other chances. And then I um, was in my second year at uni and I got offered a contract at Alloa. Um, but I ended up turning that one down because 
I just knew that there was something else there, but I wanted to finish my education off first because I thought the amount of knockbacks I've had, I've been released from Stoke, I uh, didn't get into Peterborough. I just need to keep this, I need to do my uni first, get this degree, and then I can concentrate on trying to make something for a good year out of, out of football. And then luckily it went, it went that way. And so you used to say there, it, it did go that way and your patience came through in the end. Mm. And just having that, it's almost, people say it's, it's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, isn't it? You, you've gone through, you've gone through the rain clouds, you, you've gone through the disappointment of being released, you've gone through the disappointment of trials not working out for you, but, but now you can say, I've made it, you're in league football, you're, you're playing regularly and you're ready to push on now. Yeah, um, obviously I've made it, I've, I'm, I'm a professional football now, but the work doesn't stop now, the work is even harder, but now I'm in that position where I can just focus on just playing football, where before I was doing a job, I had to go do my own gym, because then professional football is only like twice a week, uh, do my own work in, in, at the park on my own, stuff like that, so now I have that more time to focus on football, hopefully that will help me to kick on and and get as high as I can. That's absolutely brilliant from, from you today. Thanks for joining us, Josh. And Sadders fans, thanks for uh, joining us here. We hope you enjoyed the interview and we'll uh, see you back next time.